Uh, welcome to everybody who's joined us for this webinar, which is dedicated to COVID-19 and its effect on sport and the sporting environment. My name is John Patricius. I'm a sport and exercise medicine physician and an associate professor in the Faculty of Health Sciences at Wits University. And my main uh, involvement there is in the Wits Institute for Sport and Health, WISH, which is a, an initiative to collate all the expertise we have in the Johannesburg area in sport and exercise medicine in terms of academics, research and clinical service delivery. We're delighted to welcome a very diverse audience uh, geographically representing most of Johannesburg around the country, Cape Town, Port Elizabeth, Durban, Grahamstown and internationally as well. We have um, people who've joined us from Australia, the Middle East, uh, the UK and America. So welcome to you all. To help us, we've got a, a very distinguished panel. But before I introduce them, I'd just like to thank uh, some other colleagues of mine, Dr. Brad Gelbart, an orthopedic surgeon and member of our WISH Manco, who's helped us set this up, particularly from a technical point of view. Uh, Dr. Robin Saggers, who's a, a pediatrician and also works with us in the WISH team. And Professor Helen Mieswa, who's the chairperson of our WISH Manco and has been very supportive of this venture. COVID-19 is really one of those issues where there's a tremendous amount of information around, but perhaps not as many of the answers as, as we would wish. And particularly with the escalation in social media and the amount of information, much of it false available to us, it's very difficult to distinguish what is accurate and what is not. So we really hope to address some of these issues today and let you leave this webinar with uh, three things. One is clarification of the facts. The second is an ability to dispel some of the myths which are out there. And then thirdly, to place this information in the context of sport and the sporting environment in which you're involved. To the clinicians who've joined us who would like CPD points, there will be a slide put up at the end of the webinar which will have some MCQ questions which you will have to answer and an email address which you'll send through to our WISH administrator with your name and uh, Health Professional Council registration. So please don't miss out for that. Uh, importantly, if you have any questions, please use the Q&A button on the Zoom uh, screen at the bottom of the Zoom screen in the middle. Type your questions and we will try and address as many of them during the webinar and at the end of the webinar as possible. As I mentioned, COVID-19 has really dominated our lives for the last few weeks. I don't think since World War II has there ever been such an event which has disrupted sport in such a significant way. Everything from the Olympics through to Euro 2020, and in our own environments, club sport and school and hockey festivals, and those Saturday and Sunday morning sessions which we take our children to have all been brought to a sudden halt. And of course, we all have many questions. When should we be resuming sport? Will Super Rugby ever take place? Should Kaiser Chiefs be gifted the league? And of course, will Liverpool have to wait another 30 years? <laughs> Medically, there are important points to address. Lots of questions out there. What about the BCG vaccination and that theory that's abounding? What about the effect of a COVID-19 infection on our athletes? What are the benefits of exercise? When should we be resuming exercise? When should our sports teams be training and how should they resume that training? And the same thing for our schools and clubs. And finally, what lessons have we learned from this pandemic in sport and how do we take those forward? To help us answer those, I'm gonna introduce our distinguished panelists. The first of whom is Professor Guy Richards. He is an emeritus professor in the Department of Medicine uh, Faculty of Health Sciences at WITS. He's the principal physician in the pulmonology department, a critical care specialist and director of the intensive care unit at Charlotte McKeke Johannesburg Academic Hospital, where he oversees the treatment of COVID-19 patients and the protocols. Welcome, Professor Richards. Then Dr. Lee Pillay, like me, a sport and exercise medicine physician, been involved in multiple sports at a high level, but particularly we welcome him today as a member of football's PSL COVID-19 task team, 
in which he's had nearly daily input over the last few weeks. And thirdly, Dr. Jerome Mampane, also a sport and exercise medicine physician, a colleague with whom I've worked closely over the last few years in football, who's worked with our Olympic uh, organization, SASCOC, as the chief medical officer at the Africa Games, and most recently been appointed as the Springbok team doctor. Welcome, gentlemen. Uh, we look forward to your input. And before I give, hand over to Professor Richards, I really just want to make two commitments. The first is coming out of this webinar that as a team and as a WISH initiative, we will try and provide evidence-based guidelines for return to sport decisions in the context of the COVID-19 in the coming days, based on the evidence we have before us and the outcomes of this webinar. And secondly, should you enjoy this webinar, commit to hosting more of them and ask you to contact us with topics that you would like covered related to sport, exercise and medicine. This is a very scientific panel. We don't make any excuses for it being a scientific presentation, but I will commit to translating any of the medical jargon for those of you who are not medically qualified, uh, but we're sure you will find the content very interesting. I'm going to hand over to Professor Richards to bring up his presentation and enlighten us on an update on COVID-19. All right. Thanks very much. I must initially um, state that uh, I'm now an emeritus professor, which means I'm old and that they've retired me. So I'm no longer head of the critical care department uh, at WITS. Professor Murr is the, uh, is the head of critical care here. Uh, but um, nonetheless, that is my field in terms of which I have been involved. It's quite a pretty virus. It's got a number of uh, features to it. The spike protein, it's an RNA virus. It's got that envelope. It's got a hemagglutinin as well, which allows it to stick to the, uh, to the cell and then to enter into the cell as well. Do you remember that the actual virus is called the SARS-CoV-2 and the name of the disease is actually COVID-19. And really, it originated in the wet markets. You can see an example of those uh, in China, where there was contact with humans and the virus, and then probably some intermediate. And the suspicion is that it originated from a bat and then came through some, uh, some intermediate thereafter to uh, cause human infections afterwards. It's similar to both the SARS-CoV, the one in 2002, and the MERS-CoV. Uh, but it actually behaves epidemiologically much like a severe influenza season in terms of the way it actually spreads rather than what happened with the other coronavirus outbreaks that actually occurred. When we actually have a look at uh, the situation or the rapidity of the spread, in, on the 1st of March there were 107,000 cases with 3,600 deaths. Uh, I've only put the situation from the 11th because it changes so rapidly, but you can see it jumped then to a, a, a 10 times the amount, 1,703,000 with 102,000 deaths uh, and uh, 1 million uh, active cases. Uh, and of those, a, uh, most of them, or 86%, remain in the region of, of, uh, of now more uh, about 93% of those that are uh, mild and only a smaller amount that are actually serious infections as well. Mortality rate uh, has been the big concern. As you can see, when we look at the ages, when you're uh, up to about age 49, the mortality is minimal. Um, as you then get older, it starts to increase exponentially till when you are over 80, uh, the mortality can be as high as 14.8%. But do remember that there are other diseases that cause significant amounts of death every year, and particularly relevant in South Africa are the number of deaths from tuberculosis, which far exceed the deaths that we have from coronavirus uh, from a daily point of view uh, as well. The countries that are involved uh, you can see that the USA is now taken over as the lead with half a million uh, total deaths of 18,000. Spain uh, has uh, exceeded or, or the number that are, are in Italy uh, with a mortality of 16,000. But if you actually have a look at those countries, the striking thing really is the difference in mortality between the different countries. 
If you look at Italy and you look at Germany, they have around about the same number of cases total. But look at the mortality. The mortality in Italy is dramatically higher than that in Germany. Now, we're not 100% sure of the reason for that, but probably one of the most important factors there is that if you test more people, even asymptomatic people, you are going to find a larger number of milder cases. And as a consequence, your overall mortality rate is then going to be going down. So the mortality really, or the case fatality rate for SARS and MERS was seven to 10% for SARS and 30% for the MERS. Uh, and uh, 19, uh, of COVID-19, approximately 2% of confirmed cases uh, are actually asymptomatic or mildly uh, symptomatic at that time. The initial reproductive number for COVID-19 was estimated to be about 2.68, which means that each person will infect about 2.68 people as well. But in order to reduce this, we would have to decrease this, this reproductive number to less than one by appropriate control measures. And there we're talking about social distancing as well. If you look at the actual infectivity of these various diseases, you can see that the orange dot in the middle represents somebody with the disease. And you can see that MERS would only affect uh, 0.75 of a patient, influenza more, Ebola slightly more, uh, COVID-19 about 2.5, 2.6 as you can see, and measles, which is obviously a major concern, will infect a large, much greater number of people uh, in terms of its R0 or its reproductive number as well. So also remember that a significant number of acquisitions are occurring in hospitals, and that means amongst patients and healthcare workers. And the reasons for that, of course, is that not all admitted patients are recognized immediately. Not all of the infection prevention and control measures are 100% effective. And one of the big problems is, and this we've all experienced, has been running out of masks and gowns and other people, personal protective equipment. Uh, and obviously are real risks if we really increase to the numbers seen in places like Italy, Spain, New York, etc. The Chinese CDC would looked at 72,000 cases, which is the biggest case series overall. They looked at confirmed cases and suspected cases, and then they looked at the age distribution. Interestingly, only 3% were greater than 80 years. So there was a degree of protection in terms of uh, social isolating of the older people. Uh, those between the ages of 30 and 79 comprised 87%, 20 to 29 were 8%, and 10 to 19 were 1% of case, and very few in the age group of less than 10 years. At that stage, mild cases comprised 81%, severe were 14%, and critical 5%. And those are the big problem ones because those are the ones that need ICU. And ICU, of course, is limited in capacity, particularly in this country, and far more so in Italy, Spain, and the United States as well. The case fatality rate uh, was 2.3% overall. 14.8% in patients more than 80, 8% 8 in patients 70 to 79 years, and 49% in those that were critical. And those were primarily patients who had received mechanical ventilation. So mortality was ex extremely high in that setting. Healthcare personnel were about 3.8% overall of the infected people. 63% uh, of those were in Wuhan. Uh, and 14.8 were classified as severe, and they had five deaths of healthcare workers at that time as well. This was looking at the clinical uh, presentation of the patients. Uh, 1,000 of them, 2% were healthcare workers. Uh, the median age was 47, which is lower than you would uh, expect, although, as we said, the vast majority of people uh, um, uh, occurred in that age group. Um, the 41% were females, and almost all the studies have shown a male predominance of this disease. Fever on admission was only 43.8%, which gives you an idea that testing for fever at airports is not sufficient to, uh, to exclude patients. 
Fever at any time was 87% of patients and cough were the most common uh, presentations at some time in their disease. The median incubation period was three, three days, but that can be as high as 12 days. Ground glass infiltrates on the CAT scan, that's the x-ray picture that, that you would see. Uh, and then lymphopenia was extremely common uh, as well. 5% uh, were admitted to the ICU and 2.8% required mechanical ventilation um, as well. Of those with ARDS, 87.9% uh, uh, developed following hospitalization. They didn't come in with the ARDS, the acute respiratory distress syndrome at that time. So basically the definitions have changed significantly in terms of triage. And now in the hospital, we're actually having to say that any patient that comes in with an acute respiratory uh, illness, uh, which has a, a sudden onset um, with cough, sore throat, a shortness of breath or fever, normally more than 38 degrees, uh, or a history of fever as well, because they might not have it at the time, uh, then you need to consider that this might actually be the diagnosis. It used to be that it was primarily travelers or contact with somebody that had the illness, but now it actually has extended to people who have potentially no uh, contact at all, or a healthcare worker or having attended a hospital that's been working with COVID as well. In terms of the clinical uh, uh, progression, as you can see on the left-hand side, initially there's the viral response phase where you present with the common features of viral infection, your mild constitutional symptoms, your fever, your bit of diarrhea, a cough, et cetera, at that stage. You can develop a lymphopenia, you might have an increased D-dimer. Then those features actually get a little bit better. And then you start to get into the pulmonary phase where you now become short of breath, you become hypoxemic, low oxygen, abnormal chest X-ray, you still have a low normal procalcitonin, which is normally elevated more with a bacterial infection. And then those patients who develop the most severe illness get that host inflammatory response or a hyperinflammatory response, which is marked by an increase in cytokine production. And there you get your ARDS, you get your SIRS, your shock and your, uh, and your cardiac failure. Very marked elevation in inflammatory markers, C-reactive protein, interleukin-6, D-dimer, ferritin, troponin, etc. Those are the ones that are particularly uh, liable to require ventilation and also to have a higher mortality uh, as well. So the mild illness we've said that is where most people remain. In fact, probably or quite possibly most actually might be asymptomatic. But if not, most people will remain as an uncomplicated upper respiratory tract uh, infections as well. The pneumonic phase, you then obviously have signs of pneumonia. Uh, you're going to have the uh, chest crackles. You're going to have increased shortness of breath. You're going to have um, a cough um, and, and all the classical features of pneumonia uh, and obviously hypoxemia. Children, we're looking at increased respiratory rate, and that varies according to the age, uh, but they may not any at this stage have signs of severe pneumonia other than some degree of hypoxemia. Once you actually start to become uh, severe, you're now again increasing the respiratory rate, you've got distress, you've got a saturation which is low, and similar features in children uh, also with hypoxemia occurring at the same time. We are going to require to be using uh, good uh, personal protective equipment. These are the CDC ones when you are screening personnel initially but not having contact with the patient. Medical masks are necessary or surgical masks. When you're collecting specimens, you need to have goggles, face shield, we would recommend when you're doing that that you should have an N95 mask uh, because it is an aerosol generating procedure, gown and gloves as well. And when you're actually caring for the patient and you are involved in procedures, then you need to have goggle, face shield, a N95 mask, uh, gown and gloves, uh, etc. as well. And here again, uh, we would stepping up again, uh, the uh, 
goggles, face shield, N95 gown and gloves. We would prefer the N95 at an earlier phase, uh, but they're not always uh, available. And similarly, when you're transporting patients, it is important to wear appropriate uh, PPE as well. When we have a patient that we have either diagnosed or we have suspected, we would give that patient a surgical mask. We would isolate and group those with a similar diagnosis. Uh, and if you're uncertain at that stage with similar clinical features, but keep a distance between those patients as far as possible and instruct the patients to cover their nose and mouth when coughing and sneezing with your a tissue or a flexed elbow, uh, hand hygiene after contact with secretions and prevent large droplet transmission with medical masks if you're in close contact, if you're in uh, a distance of one to two meters and close contact face mask N95 or goggles, etc. Healthcare workers must have appropriate hand hygiene. Confirmed cases have uh, appropriate PPE, as I mentioned before. Disposable or dedicated equipment, if we have that available, which you often don't. Don't touch the eyes and nose and mouth. Don't touch surfaces not directly related to patient care, like door handles or light switches, and ensure adequate room ventilation and avoid, avoid the movement of patients uh, or transport, if you possibly can, between units or between hospitals, if that's possible. Remember that you have a, a fairly long period of time that, uh, that the virus may be infectious. Aerosols can be infectious for up to two, with a half-life of 2.74 hours. Copper surfaces, 3.76. Cardboard is a bit shorter. Steel is a bit longer. Plastic is fairly long as well. Uh, and the detection limit can be up to a significant number of days in terms of how long you can actually find the virus on surfaces as well. Whether it's infectious on those surfaces is not 100% sure. When we are doing these, and this is really only for the ICU people, uh, aerosol generating procedures, suctioning, intubation, bronchoscopy, etc., we would need to have particularly well uh, protected personnel from the PPE point of view and preferably you'd need to have a room with a minimum of 12 air changes and we generally short of these types of things with um, without access to negative pressure ventilation areas as well. All of them introduce all of the coronaviruses induce excessive non uh, aberrant non-effective immune responses with a massive increase potentially of cytokine production. And in survivors after ventilation, there may be some lung damage and fibrosis uh, with long-term disability, although that's been seen less often uh, as well. So we support them initially with oxygen, conservative fluid management. We might treat with an antibiotic until we're certain it's not bacterial. We don't give routine systemic corticosteroids and we monitor closely for clinical uh, deterioration. We would give a high flow nasal or a non-invasive ventilation only in selected patients because it can cause aerosolization. Uh, and we would be looking at um, the use of um, something like high flow nasal along with a, a surgical mask over the patient in your mild to moderate or non-worsening uh, patient there as well. If you need to intubate, it must be by the most experienced provider. This is a single hospital experience of critically ill patients. 52 of them were critically ill in this group overall. 61% um, had died by 28 days. Uh, the median time from ICU admission to death, I'm afraid I can't see the actual number, but that was a ratio between 3 to 11 days. The non-survivors were older at 64.6 versus 51.9. They were more likely to develop ARDS. That was the primary reason they died, 81%. And most of them also had multiple organ dysfunction as well. And there were significant differences in the clinical parameters like lymphocyte counts, platelet counts, albumin, bilirubin, et cetera, uh, et cetera. The X-ray changes, 
That's the type of thing you see on CT scan, those patchy ground glass infiltrates that you see peripherally as the early one, and that gets progressively worse. Uh, when we see survival, one of the strong predictors of whether you survive or not is your D-dimer level. You can see that in the red on the left, the rising D-dimer level is associated with a significant increase uh, in the mortality. And similarly, the lymphopenia is more severe, but the most striking one is in the D-dimer value as well. On the left there is your troponin, and you can see that the troponin elevation is also associated with significant mortality, and that's related to cardiac dysfunction. And on the right-hand side, that is your lactate dehydrogenase, which also rises as mortality uh, or correlates with the increased mortality as well. So one of the best markers <clears throat> overall is in fact the interleukin-6 level, which can be actually performed. And it, uh, uh, the elevated uh, level was strongly associated with mechanical ventilation with a very low p-value and a level of more than 80 predicted respiratory failure with an extremely high uh, accuracy as well. So it is that hyperinflammatory response that in which the mortality uh, actually occurs. Cardiac disease and thrombotic episodes uh, uh, contribute to mortality. Uh, this is a, a study that was looking at the use of low molecular weight heparin and a multivariate analy analysis, D-dimer, the prothrombin time and the age were uh, positively associated and the platelet count negatively correlated with 28-day mortality. Heparin was only of benefit in those with the more extensive thrombosis as evidenced by sepsis-induced coagulation score or a D-dimer more than six-fold above the upper limit of normal. So the D-dimer, again, is a very important parameter of mortality. In patients receiving antiviral therapy, the low molecular weight heparin reduced hypercoagulability, inhibited IL-6, and counteracted the IL-6 biological activity. And so we would treat our patients all with these ill patients with full anticoagulation and with heparin as well. And with regard to cardiovascular disease as well, 23% um, of patients died. And if you looked at the mortality according to the coronary vascular, the cardiovascular disease and elevated troponin T, that was 7.6% in those with no cardiovascular disease and a normal troponin, 13.3% if you had cardiovascular disease and a normal troponin, 37% if you had no coronary vascular disease and an elevated troponin, and 69% if you had both cardiovascular disease and an elevated troponin as well. So a significant factor. Chloroquine, pros and cons, uh, the evidence in fact is poor, studies are of poor quality and there's no definite benefit uh, observed, but often when you're left with very little, you try um, whatever happens to be available. Tocilizumab is being used uh, in patients with severe disease. This is an agent that was primarily used for rheumatoid arthritis and inhibits interleukin-6. And uh, in a small study of 21 patients in patients with very elevated interleukin-6, there was significant improvement even by the first day. Uh, and this was despite them all having deteriorated despite routine therapies in the previous weeks. And uh, no short-term adverse effects were actually noticed. And it's now actually recognized as a treatment for severe and critical cases with elevated interleukin-6 in China. Difficult to know when precisely to administer it. Uh, does one only give it with the hyperinflammatory response or give it earlier? And we certainly would only administer when we do have all the features of an elevated CRP, ferritin, D-dimer, worsening hypoxemia, uh, et cetera. Another anti-inflammatory agent that may be of benefit in small studies, particularly in the previous coronavirus infections, SARS-CoV and MERS-CoV, the IV glo intravenous globulins show clinical benefit with good tolerance, and there may be some benefit here in that hyperinflammatory response. Corticosteroids, uh, a multi-center randomized controlled trial in 17 Spanish ICUs, 
with moderate to severe disease. They actually had PF ratios of 200. They were already on PEEPs of more than 10 and FI2, in other words, oxygen of more than 0.5. Uh, they were randomized to receive dexamethasone, 20 milligrams daily from day one to five, and then daily uh, 10 milligrams from day six to 10, or routine care. And the ventilator days were freer, were higher at 4.8 days, more ventilator free days. And the mortality was 21% versus 36%. So in our patients with a mnemonic illness, we initiate corticosteroids early to try to prevent progression to the hyperinflammatory phase as well. So COVID-19, and I've not been able to cover all of its aspects, uh, but to give you a broad overview, it certainly is a deadly disease, but it's not too deadly. And that means, in fact, that spread will be enhanced because there are patients wandering around who are relatively asymptomatic or completely asymptomatic and they may enhance spread. The primary aim was initially to intercept cases coming into South Africa, but at the pandemic phase where we are at the moment, it becomes much more difficult to case trace and that's why we have such social uh, isolation you know, in order to try and prevent spread. Many epidemiologists estimate that you're going to need to get 40 to 70 percent of the population infected in order to get herd immunity to prevent spread around the country as well. But if we get rapid, very rapid surge spread in South Africa, our health services would be rapidly overwhelmed, and that means the ICU uh, particularly. Uh, and even those that occurred in Italy uh, initially. Uh, would be a major problem in terms of uh, our situation. So vigilance, careful management to avoid the disease, a weight of vaccine and effective therapies, and that's really where we are at the moment. So thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Richard. I think that was an excellent synopsis uh, of the science behind this disease that uh, we're dealing with. Um, while you take a sip of uh, coffee there, can I ask you to consider some of the questions that have come through from some of the participants uh, in this, this webinar? The first is, if uh, an athlete or anyone else is infected, what are the chances of reinfection? Well, this is a question which hasn't been fully answered. We don't believe that, in fact, patients do get reinfected. We believe that where people have tested positive again, they are picking some, up some of the antigenic material from the virus, which is still persistent in the upper pharynx. Uh, when you have antibody formation, that's the basis or would be the basis of a vaccine that would prevent further systemic infection thereafter. So we believe that it doesn't actually um, uh, reinfect. Talking of the uh, antibodies uh, in, in the system, will there be a place for testing athletes uh, for their antibody status before allowing them to return to sport? So, the, unfortunately, the antibodies only really elevate after a number of days of having had the infection. So, in general, your IgM antibodies rise first, and they would normally start appearing after five to six days with IgE, sorry, IgGs appearing after about 10 to 12 days, which indicates that you have had an, inf an infection. The, um, all that that antibody test would say is that you've had the infection. It doesn't tell you anything about your fitness for, uh, for sport or not. Thank you. Can you comment on the, this concept of viral load and the amount of virus that you're exposed to and how that may uh, have implications for the type of, of disease or severity of disease that you might uh, suffer? Well, it seems that the bigger the viral load, the more rapid the onset of the disease and possibly also the more severe that disease is. And that's been noticed, for example, in ENT surgeons who have operated on patients who are uh, infected, received large doses of the virus rapidly became infected and many of those also severely ill. 
So it's quite probable that smaller uh, doses initially would allow a slower response to the disease and then potentially not as severe. In terms of exposure of our athletes to uh, this virus, obviously there's, there's significant concern about potential respiratory compromise moving forward. What are the risks of permanent damage? And in athletes, that might mean something as little as two or three percent might make a, a huge difference to their careers. What are the risks that, that we know of, of more permanent damage and even mild to moderate exposure? So we wouldn't expect there to be any permanent damage at all in patients who have not gone on to the severe disease with uh, ARDS or the acute respiratory distress syndrome. Those ground glass infiltrates clear completely and do not remain or do not leave fibrotic scarring. It is those patients that end up on the uh, ventilator, mechanical ventilator, that uh, and who survive that, that result or have uh, the potential for fibrotic lung disease and uh, disability thereafter. A relatively high proportion of athletes are on asthma medication. Uh, they have varying severities of asthma. Is there a greater risk for them in terms of contracting uh, the, the virus? Interesting, no. Interestingly, no. I reviewed this recently and um, in all of the studies, asthma has not been seen, or COPD for that matter, has not been seen to be a major risk factor for this disease. Obviously, if you do have COPD and you happen to get the disease, then you are more likely to be compromised because of the underlying pulmonary disease that you have. But uh, asthmatics do not appear to be more at risk. And in fact, one uh, inhaler, cyclesonide, actually might have some antiviral activity. So certainly do not stop your normal uh, therapy that you would take for asthma, because that is more likely to compromise you should you actually get the illness. Great. Can you explain the male predominance uh, in this condition? Yeah, well, that's a difficult one. Um, you know, we generally are the weaker sex anyway. And if you look at... Uh, mortalities in uh, ICU, those for males are generally always a little bit higher as well. I'm not sure of the answer to that. Um, and I'm not sure um, if, I can, if I can explain that. I'm not even going to try. Last question before we move on to the next presentation. The row, is there any role for hyperbaric oxygen treatment or plasmapheresis? <clears throat> well, um, Hyperbaric oxygen therapy, no, um, because you, in order to oxygenate your patient, if they are pr profoundly hypoxemic, you actually have to administer the oxygen via the lungs. And those patients would not be able to breathe appropriately because of the uh, low compliance of their lungs, would not be able to draw air in and out of the lungs themselves. So that would not be uh, a, a possibility. Plasmapheresis was considered to be a possibility because there was one theory that the virus actually attacked the heme molecule and caused release of iron into the circulation. And then the hypoxemia would, or the hypoxia, which is decreased delivery of oxygen to the tissues, was often related to a, a, an abnormality of the red cell, which couldn't carry oxygen anymore. In addition, there was the possibility that the iron might lead to an increase in reactive oxidants with pulmonary fibrosis. That probably is not the case. It doesn't appear to be a, a well-founded theory. Thank you very much uh, to Professor Richards for those questions. I'm gonna ask you to stay around because I think there's a lot of uh, useful questions coming in and also to the participants. I think the questions coming in are very interesting and uh, will add to the substance of the webinar. So please keep them coming in. I'm going to ask uh, Dr. Pillay to load his presentation and talk to us a little bit about exercise, the physiology behind the positive effects of exercise and exercise in the context of this pandemic we're experiencing. I'm going to hand over to you, Dr. Pillay. Uh, thanks for handing over to me. Thanks, Prof, for 
a little bit more insight into the scientific uh, aspect of things. I'm going to talk about a few things in this short few minutes that I have. And these are the things we're going to discuss. Number one, the science behind exercise and the immune system. Readjusting for those events that you were prepping for. Maintaining conditioning. Decent links for exercising at home. Returning to sport post-COVID-19 infection. And my function on the PSL task team. I'm going to just share a little bit of information where I can't really share too much at this point. So let's just go through a few definitions. What does our immune system basically comprise of? And let's look at simple aspects of things. It's your granulocytes, your monocytes, your lymphocytes, and your dendritic cells. So these are all the cells involved in attacking your any kind of viral infection or bacterial infection, etc. When it comes to moderate activity, CDC and ACSM describe it as three to six meds per hour. Uh, uh, to get moderate activity. So you want to break a bit of a sweat when you do moderate activity, but not too much of a sweat and not be very tired. Whereas intense activity is greater than six minutes where you are very tired after the event, uh, sweating quite a bit, short of breath, and uh, you know you've done some exercise. So I think it's important to differentiate between those two. So let's talk about exercise in the immune system. Uh, this has been going on for a long time where we've realized that even in the 90s already, uh, we've seen that moderate exercise over a long period of time lowers your incidence and your duration of developing our respiratory tract infections. Even up to recently, many, many studies, uh, studies have been done that show that uh, a moderately active lifestyle reduces your incidence of infections as well. Whereas there's been a lot of evidence recently and also back in the 80s when some data was taken from Two Oceans Marathon where prolonged and strenuous activity actually increases your risk of developing respiratory tract infections. So what is this whole open window phase that everyone always talks about? Uh, this is also quite a um, important factor to remember with exercising uh, patients as well. So this is uh, classically where someone undergoes a lot of strenuous heavy activity uh, at high intensities and the immune system dips for the next three to 72 hours after that, making them susceptible to different types of infections that they're exposed to. So exercise basically is stress immunology. And when you exercise, you produce an inflammatory response. This is followed by the body's natural mechanism to bring down this inflammation and it down regulates this response. Hence, when these aspects happen, our immunity starts getting affected. Moderate exercise done on a regular basis, however, improves your immune response towards things. So essentially, when you are doing high intensity and prolonged strenuous period of exercise, you initially get a lymphocytosis, adrenaline, cortisol, all of these aspects increase. As Prof has mentioned, part of uh, and parcel of the COVID-19 disease is the lymphopenia. So after exercise, with this massive anti-inflammatory response that your body mounts, you undergo some lymphopenia as well. So all your mechanisms that are there to try and reduce your rates of infection, all your protective mechanisms start reducing. Your acquired uh, uh, mechanisms like your IgG, IgM, et cetera, and even your mucosal mechanisms of decreasing infections all reduce. And the cumulative effect becomes a significant decrease in the immune response. Now, a lot of us that are involved as uh, clinical persons in the sports environment, we see this often happening in a pre-season environment where there is intense exercise with short spaces of rest, et cetera. And uh, that's probably the most often that we see most of our athletes develop in cases. I'm not sure where that background is coming from, but anyway. Um, okay, so the take home message that I would like to get across here with exercising the immune system of giving you a little bit of a background as to why we shouldn't at this point be doing strenuous, intense exercises is because of increasing our risk of infection. So during the lockdown, it's important to avoid high intensity and strenuous exercises. Okay, rather opt for moderate intensity exercises and we, during this we are actually down-regulating the cardiorespiratory system 
with doing consistent type of moderate related exercises. But unfortunately, we have no choice in this matter. And we cannot try and adjust things to increase that intensity without in increasing our risk of developing an infection. So after the lockdown, it's all about a progressive load exercise, which we always tell athletes, they never listen to us. Hopefully now they listen to us. No sudden increase in load, intensity or duration of your exercise, and it must be a progressive program over that period of time. What I would like to share with you, and I'm going to add another presentation here, is uh, this is from the Australian Institute of Sports, showing that after long periods of lockdown uh, or, or long periods of inactivity, what would be the ideal amount of time to return to specific levels of activity. There's a nice little table over here, which tells you, if you look at most athletes and given their home programs, at this point in time, they're probably doing stuff at about 40%. This tells you for the amount of time that they're out, how long they will require to return back to their physical activity levels as they were prior to everything. So at the moment, our lockdown is sitting on five weeks. So to return to your previous sport, you're probably looking at about a four to five week period to return to that same kind of uh, level of activity. Right. Um, let's just go back to the slide. Sorry about that. Right, so our next aspect is about training regimes and adjusting it accordingly in this environment. So there's obviously a reduction in your usual activity and a lot of people are becoming bored and they're starting to do silly exercises, stuff that they've never done and don't know how to do. And in fact, I'm getting lots of phone calls about athletes that have injured themselves doing silly things. So your athletes should stay and do what they have been advised. And there's also nutritional challenges. With the only way of getting out of the house, going to buy essentials, people end up buying a lot of crisps, chocolates, snacks that they wouldn't normally. It's important to be diligent about staying with your diet and ensuring that you eat the correct stuff, especially loading with your protein when you're doing these exercises. Some people don't have the privilege of having a backyard and they've just got a little uh, townhouse flat with a small balcony. So your space is, is limited as well. And we, one of the few countries that have clearly not allowed people going outside during this lockdown. And I think that's an important fact because if we want to really practice social distancing, uh, if we start giving too early to these simple aspects, we might end up running into a bigger problem. So I think that is a right thing and we need to just adhere by those regulations. So if you have access to any equipment at home, a rower, a cycle, a treadmill, which I'm not really a fan of, especially for your running athletes, damaging their knees, et cetera, over long periods of time. But if it's something that you have in order to help with your cardiovascular, respiratory fitness, uh, by all means use it. Uh, prior to the lockdown, lots of companies were renting their stuff out and there are some essential services companies that are in fact setting things up for people uh, as we speak as well. Plan your hydration and plan your eating. So the same way you would plan according to any of your normal training regimes, plan it accordingly as well. Don't forget to do your activations and your stretches, etc. prior to doing all these strength and running activities that you are doing because you can still sustain an injury doing these activities in a smaller space, in a smaller environment. The most important thing is the mental resilience. If you don't have that mental resilience to say that you need to continue having a plan of action uh, and continue with your exercises, you will go mad in your head. That is what lockdowns do to people. So what you need to do is understand there are things that are in your control and things that are out of your control. The lockdown is out of your control at this moment. So change what you can and change your training regime accordingly. Plan with your physiotherapist, your biokineticist, your trainer, and other friends of doing Zoom sessions. That also helps make things a bit interest, uh, interesting. Try and downregulate all your exercises you were previously doing at least by a minimum of 10%. And avoid high intensity sessions. Okay, as we've mentioned, it affects our immune system, high intensity sessions, and we advise him that people do moderate intensity exercises during this period. Okay. Uh, try and maintain a routine. Routines are important and make exercise fun at home. So come up with different concepts of trying to do things. Play a bit of tennis against your wall. And uh, goal setting is important, but goal achieving at this point is not so important. It's going to be near next to impossible to periodize yourself. 
uh, in this environment and not sure of when this lockdown will end. So I would say just stick to your moderate exercise routine for now. Very importantly, which we forget about is good sleep. So sleep well, so you can recover better for your exercise the next day. And this is an opportunity to work on your deficits. So what your physio and your bio and your trainer has told you you've been weak at, they would have given you programs to focus on these aspects. And that's where we come into injury prevention. So a lot of uh, team sports and some individual athletes have been given strength training programs by the trainers and their bios and their physios. And it's important to do these exercises without going into a high intensity phase. A lot of the professionals are available to assist with doing this via Zoom, etc. And uh, it seems to be working quite well, especially when you need a bit of guidance when it comes to these aspects. Monitor your weight and your diet, like I said. Remember, you're doing less activities, burning less calories, so don't take in too much calories. Consider supplementing things with your micronutrients and vitamin D3 as well. I think that's an important aspect, especially that you're not going outside as often as you would. Um, that may also help as an antioxidant to improve some of your immune responses as well. Start doing a bit more functional movements in the yard, in the balcony. You need to be breathing some fresh air, so keep a window open at home. And again, mental resilience and keep positive minded. The other important thing is the availability of that alcohol that was sitting in your cupboard all these months, all along while you were training, and now there's nothing else to do but drink it. Please avoid that because too much alcohol intake reduces your immune system as well and puts you at these risks. What's important is that if you finished it, very good because you're not going to get a chance to stock up on that again. Maintain your neuromuscular control with your activations. Okay. Again, as I've mentioned, it's an opportunity to focus on your deficits. If you had weak glutes or weak VMOs, focus on those things to improve them. Weak proprioception, focus on that. And a reminder that as I've shown you in that graph previously, you probably need more or less the same amount of weeks in order to return to your same level of activity. So there must be a progressive load in that time in order to improve your levels of activity and avoid sustaining injuries come the time that lockdown becomes a bit more relieved. Uh, adequate sleep, I cannot stress more on that and the positive mindset as well. Okay. So let's suppose you are that athlete or that person who's an exercise, a, 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 you're an athlete or a recreational athlete and you do end up contracting COVID-19. The material of the phase and the age, et cetera, and the severity that you do uh, sustain the infection, I think the basics come into play. Uh, going back to normal respiratory infections, the neck rule is important. So any symptoms below the level of the neck, do not exercise, do not increase your cardiovascular level. Okay, uh, and again, it depends on that phase of illness. So if your symptoms, so there's a couple of suggestions. Basin, that's our British uh, uh, Association of Sport and Exercise Medicine. Um, they have also suggested that after you have an infection and if symptoms have settled down for at least three days after that, you may slowly start introducing yourself to cardiovascular training. Uh, Brett et al. recently also suggested a three-day window period. Um, there's no real definitive basis as to where they come up with these numbers. Uh, and I would be wary of that because we really don't know what, what, what the consequences of this virus is. So in reality, we don't know its effects afterwards, even though Prof. has assured us that very unlikely these patients will have respiratory or cardiac dysfunction. Um, and we know that it has renal and liver negative effects. So aspects when it comes to your eating habits, your recovery uh, and your training is all important in this phase. Prof has mentioned the cytokine storm and the hypoxia, which we've seen in plenty of his slides previously. And these all contribute to the damage to organs. So we don't know at a mild and medium and a moderate and a severe phase, what damage has been sitting. So my suggested approach for people, and this has come from looking at various published articles all over the place that have come with different kind of aspects. I would suggest if you have contracted the disease, it's important to get your uh, 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 working knowledge of what your liver function, kidney function, your full blood count, 
your platelets and your white cell fun, uh, cells are looking like, number one. A full flow volume loop test, and then a stress ECG, a rest ECG followed by an echo and probably a stress ECG should you have had severe disease. Now it would be very nice if everyone had had uh, basic comparisons to these numbers to be able to see where you're sitting now post the infection. If not, at least it gives you some kind of a guideline. And I would tread this carefully until we have a little bit more knowledge about this virus and what kind of cytokine storm it does create afterwards. And I would slowly have a progressive load program um, after being cleared to exercise within about six weeks or so. So essentially, after detraining you, we take a small step into getting you back into the program. Right, when it comes to online exercise resources, there are plenty of them. Make sure that you go to credible sources, okay? Because there's several of things on YouTube and Instagram. Um, one of the things that I find very important, especially with this frustrating kind of period, is sometimes we need some mental relaxation. And I think those, uh, a lot of the yoga programs via these uh, uh, YouTubes and Instagram can assist you in that. Team sports, a lot of guys are doing things via Zoom as a team setting, so it makes you feel like everyone's doing things together again and you're not alone in your house. I've come across quite a few nice exercise related resources and I'm sure uh, John will share uh, these links with you, uh, but they come from very verifiable resources. The American College of Sports Medicine, where they've given us nice good guidelines there. The exercise is medicine movement via VITS. And also Basin has given us a lot of guidelines. The other thing that you can do, a lot of your physios, your biokineticists, and your trainers have started putting things online via YouTube, via Instagram, and even follow some of your favorite athletes. One such is Nolene Conrad, who I've been watching diligently over the last couple of weeks, and she puts in nice little exercises that she's probably been taught by her physio and a biokineticist. And that helps you to be able to stick with the program and see how these exercises are done. But make sure that you're getting things from verifiable uh, sources and not Joe Soap. So one of the other aspects that I was asked to talk about is my function on the PSL task team. So the task team is made of two arms. One is a health arm, the other one is the regulatory issues. Obviously as a sports physician, I'm working on the health arm perspective. Now, it's a program that's in process and um, we've, 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 we've moved towards a direction where we've already got a lot of documentation all sorted out. And we've decided to move because it's a health related thing. It's health heavy, not regulatory heavy. And the health heaviness comes within prophylaxis, preventative measures, etc. And this is something that potentially if the lockdown becomes eased off and we do move in. We've put very strict guidelines when it comes to match days, uh, actually strict protocols when it comes to match days, and then guidelines for teams outside of match days within their spaces of uh, things that they can perhaps consider doing. Um, remember, these kind of issues are not easily made where there's five people making a decision on this. So just to give you an idea of what happens, the task teams have set together, the regulatory team and the health team have put all the information together. The PSL now takes all that information and packages it in a nice little package for us to deliver to the EXCO. The EXCO will then gratify it to say yay or nay or we need this to be changed or this doesn't make sense, etc. After that, that will be presented then to the National Commissioner and to the Department of Health for approval. Um, again, I cannot divulge too much information of the details of things, but there is processes in place. I cannot give you timelines because a lot of these things do take time to happen. And at this point in time, uh, it is quite a difficult decision to make in order to get hold of the National Commissioner and Department of Health because they're obviously inundated with more important things from a national perspective. And um, this is always on the front of our minds. Um, and it's a living document. So all these aspects and all these recommendations are actually changing every 48 hours. So looking at all the resources I look at, I'm actually changing these documents every 48 hours where it becomes more and more relevant when it comes to what WHO, what the CDC, what our NICD and our DOH 
is putting out there in the public uh, in order to make sure that we comply with the law, we comply with the Disaster Management Act, and most importantly, we ensuring that there is safety processes in protocols in place for teams, ambulance services, um, players, technical staff, referees, everyone. Um, I thank you. Uh, that's the end of my presentation. Thanks very much, uh, Dr. Pillay, for that uh, very interesting and informative presentation, which placed a lot of the aspects that Professor Richards discussed in a sporting context. Unsurprisingly, a lot of the questions coming through are related to returning to sport, both for individuals and for groups, for clubs and schools in particular. So I won't ask you to answer this now, but I'd like all the panelists just to give some thought over the next 15 or 20 minutes as to the strategy for return to sport if you're looking after a school or a club. What are the important considerations for individuals and for groups and for spectators? And I'm sure on your task team, you've been considering a lot of these factors, but let's bring it down to very much more of a community level. Those are the answers that people are looking for. So let's give some consideration to that. Can I pose a couple of other questions to the panelists? Uh, perhaps Professor Richards, the spread of the virus through sweat, what evidence is there? That I have no idea. Um, the, um, the amount of the virus in stool and urine is minimal. Um, the most virus is obtained from bronchial washings. Uh, I don't think anybody has measured in sweat, but if you are running and you're panting, uh, you are more likely to spread it that way than by contact with sweat. Thank you. Two other issues that are really very specific to sportsmen and relevant to sports persons. The first is the use of anti-inflammatories, which are widespread in sport. Now, there's been some debate in the literature with ibuprofen in particular, the use of anti-inflammatories and their effect on someone who has the disease. Well, there is a concern um, and that it might actually be uh, worsen the, the condition, probably because they do have an anti-inflammatory action. And in fact, um, when you look at um, the um, necrotizing fasciitis in women who've received a non-steroidal after an episiotomy, you get a significant increase in infection in that way as well. If you have a pneumonia and you take a non because of the pain, you're more likely to get an empyema. So there is a sort of an immunosuppressant effect that goes along with the use of non -steroidal. So where possible, I would avoid them. And that's not talking about all the concern with regard to renal injury or gastric irritation, etc. A lot of athletes take supplements then are there supplements which perhaps may have a protective effect? And are there supplements which, if you have the infection, may help improve the prognosis? You see, unfortunately, there are no substances specifically that can improve the immune system unless you actually are malnourished. So um, in general, supplements are not going to be of much benefit to you except possibly vitamin D because vitamin D does have a negative uh, regulatory effect on your renin and angiotensin system which may be involved in harm in the um, in the lungs in particular or organ damage uh, that actually occurs so your renin and angiotensin and aldosterone system is part of the cause of the uh, tissue injury that occurs, and maybe vitamin D will be uh, helpful. Thank you. There was uh, also a question, a uh, theoretical question about healthy individuals deliberately exposing themselves to the virus to develop immunity. Uh, is this something that perhaps uh, one could recommend in people who have no uh, obvious risk factors? Is there some merit in this? Well, the vast majority of infections, as I mentioned, are asymptomatic or mildly uh, symptomatic. 
currently on world meter when we're looking at the active cases that are recognized at the moment 93 percent uh, are mild uh, and uh, only a small percentage are actually severe or critical so you cannot predict however whether you are likely to go into that severe or, or, or critical category we know certain risk factors and there's age there's high blood pressure there's heart disease there's diabetes there's obesity there's male sex all of those are risk factors for severity but you can't predict whether you might actually be one of those people who get the severe disease so i i, I think it's not a good idea but do also remember that many countries are actually uh, expecting or trying to get to a point where you've got 40 to 70 percent of your population who have been infected so that the herd immunity will actually protect those people who actually are at risk so it's quite possible that people will become infected anyway and then finally from some of the sports physicians and i'll probably take a crack at answering this there's some questions about your treatment protocol and the potential for them being tested as, as potentially banned substances or, or interventions. And the only ones I can think of which might play a role are, are corticosteroids and IV therapies. But I, I would suggest that if you're receiving those uh, in an ICU environment, you have very, very little chance of being in a competitive sporting environment for, for some while. So I don't think there's any, any significance in, in worrying about that in, in those, those conditions. I'm going to hand over to Dr. Mampane now to uh, talk us through his part of the presentation and uh, keep those questions coming. I'll try and address as many of them with the panelists as possible. I'm going to hand over to you, uh, Jerome. Thanks very much, John. Thanks uh, for the opportunity, I think, to share this uh, platform with you guys. Um, um, I just, the task that I was given basically was to look into the financial implications for sport and individuals in the current climate um, to check if there's funding that's accessible to teams or sports persons. Um, the other question is, do they need the forced rest? Um, and what are the professional players doing currently? Uh, what hygiene lessons, uh, which we are learning now or have learned, can, can sports people actually take with them going forward? Um, and also with social distan distancing, um, is there a le uh, risk of less stringent monitoring of doping? Um, and also when, when clubs return, when clubs and schools feel when can clubs and schools feel safe returning to their sporting programs? And when they do return, are there additional precautions that should be taken? Um, so I just wanted to touch on each of these things. Um, I've tried to just find information. I hope you'll find this useful. Um, so globally, we've seen a cessation of sport activities across the board. Um, the sole exception that I really could find online and in sport media was the Belarusian Football League, uh, who continued to play despite protest action in the form of fans from nine clubs staying away from football stadiums. So looking at some of the biggest sports in the world, uh, the NBA in the United States has suspended all play indefinitely since the 11th of March, 2020. Um, they're looking to resume uh, play from around the 14th of June, 2020. Now, according to a Forbes article by Tony Fitzgerald on the 12th of March, 2020, um, in 2019, the NBA finals alone brought in uh, $288 million in advertising revenue over six games. Uh, the Super Bowl as well also brought in quite a significant amount of money, which is $336 million. But the NBA playoffs in isolation account for about 62% of the league's advertisement revenue. So the financial implications for the suspension of the NBA playoffs will probably more likely reach well beyond the NBA itself because um, channels like ESPN, TNT, ABC broadcast the NBA conference finals. And these broadcasters combine together uh, to pay about $2.6 billion um, to carry the, the game itself through till 2025. So the networks will be missing out on the ad spending revenue um, that comes with the playoffs and the channels probably will have to fill in uh, the vacated slots uh, with other content. But the problem with sport is quite unique in, in it being um, content that generates as much ratings. For the NBA players, I managed to find that in an article written on the, on the ESPN website, that there's a provision within the collective bargaining agreement in the NBA, which allows for the withholding of a portion of a player's seasonal salaries uh, per cancel game. So, and one of the circumstances that's, that's made provision for is actually epidemics and pandemics. 
So around the world, most football operations as well have come to a grinding halt. Uh, FIFA recently released a media statement titled FIFA Guidelines to address the legal consequences of COVID-19. In these guidelines, they sought to address the challenges posed by expiring contracts and the changes in the transfer window periods. FIFA has recommended that contracts be extended until the official end of the relevant football seasons, while also committing to being flexible to shifting the transfer window to a period between the end of the old season and the start of the new season, whenever that may be. In the UK, professional football has been on hold since around the 13th of May, 13th, sorry, 13th of March, 2020. And no doubt there've been multiple considerations on how and when to proceed. Um, any of the season, of course, is very complicated. Um, so what's at stake? Well, sports.ndtv.com quoted a senior broadcasting official as saying, for the Premier League, uh, you're talking about 3 billion, that's $3.7 billion, so 3 billion pounds income a year from overseas and domestic TV rights. The same official also pointed out that there would be financial implications if the competitions were squeezed, uh, so fewer matches were played. In a statement published on the Premier League website on the 5th of April, 2020, I wanted to briefly examine a few noteworthy points. It was acknowledged that the Premier League will not resume at the beginning of May and that the 2019 season will only return when it's safe and appropriate to do, to do so. Together with this, the Premier League also went on to concede that any return to play will only be uh, with the full support of the government. That probably will have some sort of potential uh, setback with regards to their return to play dates. Um, they reported that the restart date is under constant review with all stakeholders that are involved. Now with this, there's, there's a combined objective for all remaining domestic league and cup matches to be played, enabling, the, enabling them to maintain the integrity of the competition. Now, I wrote that, uh, as I understand it, that this is probably with the consideration that the relegation promotion match uh, between the English Premier League and, and the Championship is probably considered one of the most lucrative football, football matches uh, in the world. Uh, the windfall offers significant terms. The windfall promote, sorry, the windfall that promotion offers uh, is significant in terms of team allowances for the Premier League, and as well as revenue from broadcast deals. So, regarding the broadcast deals, here's a quote from uh, football finances expert Kieran Maguire, published on the Independent.co.uk. Um, the difference between the Premier League broadcasting deal, which is worth a minimum of 100 million pounds a season, to the 7 million pounds you get in the Championship is so significant that I think clubs would be foolish not to explore all options, including making a litigious appeal. So in the, in the face of substantial and continuing losses for the 2019 season, since the suspension of the matches began, and to protect employment throughout the professional game, the Premier League, the, the Premier League clubs also unanimously agreed to consult their players regard, regarding a combination of uh, conditional reductions and deferrals amounting to 30% of uh, total annual remuneration. So, Basically, that just roughly says that the players have agreed to take a pay cut so that some operations can continue. Um, Dr. Mampane, can I just interrupt you a second? Can you sit a bit yeah. closer to the mic? It's, it seems to be it's cutting difficult in to hear out. me. Yeah, that's better. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry, apologies. So just continuing on from where I left off, um, I'll try and speak a bit louder. According to a Fox to FoxBusiness.com article, by cancelling the NCAA men's and women's basketball tournaments for the first time on record, um, the collegiate sports organization forfeited its most lucrative event, which is the Division I men's basketball tournament, which generates around $865 million annually from television and marketing rights. Now, worldwide, there isn't a sport that hasn't been affected. Um, in cricket, the Indian Premier League has been suspended. Golf has been suspended, which I can fist pump for. MMA bouts and lucrative MMA bouts with lucrative purses and pay-per-view earnings have had to be rescheduled. The Olympics and the Euro 2020 competitions have had to be rescheduled to 2021. So locally, for locally in South Africa, I mean, what it means for us, well, there was a quote I think that I can take from my player CEO Eugene Henning, which was published on Sports sorry, Sports 24. Uh, we still need to quantify the impact of no rugby being played. And it, will be, and it will be based on the worst case scenario for SA Rugby. The next step is to decide how much to cut salaries. It will then be submitted to players, to players' representatives for approval. Uh, again, I, I'm not in a position to necessarily co comment on the PSL as I've not found many regulations with regards to how the PSL is going, but I'm sure our colleague Dr. Blake could advise us on that. Um, but I wanted to say that what it means for the sport industry is that 
you know, a direct stop in match revenue for clubs and those involved in the piecing together of the spectacle um, has a lot of actually widespread impact. Parking revenue is affected, the sale of food and beverages is, is affected, including the various vendors and industry players that are involved in this. Uh, the provision of security and the acquisition of staff to fulfill this role is, is, a, is a effect. The clubs, uh, for the clubs, sales of merchandise and memorabilia is affected. The sale of hospitality packages is affected. Uh, the media rights sold in, in content agreements and revenue, and the, the revenue that this generates are also affected. So clubs may be finding themselves now with costs uh, that are suddenly not being met um, with, because they don't have any revenue coming. And finally, at an individualized level, I tried to actually make sure that I could contextualize it well by speaking to just two athletes that, that um, I could speak to that closely. One is a uh, potential Olympian, and it was interesting, I think, in our conversation that he mentions that the funding he would receive would be about 15,000 rands for the, from the IOC as a, as a potential Olympian. And then the other funds that he would make are from sponsorship appearances and sponsorship, um, sorry, sponsorship fees, as well as sponsorship appearance fees. And also there, there'd be competition appearance fees and winning bonuses. Now, as you can see that, you know, in the current climate we're in, especially in South Africa, those kind of things now have just gone out the window um, because there's no competitions for the guy to participate in. Um, I've spoken with the rugby player as well. And similarly, I think the same, the same theme seems to permeate across this. Um, for, our interne for our more senior international sports people, um, some, are, some that are actually applying their trade overseas, that has translated into pay cuts in rugby. Um, while maybe the, the exchange rate affords them to still smile a bit, but it is still significant that they've uh, suffered these pay cuts. So going forward, is there funding accessible to sports to teams or sports persons? Uh, one, one need only search online to find various economic response plans of various nations to the effects of the COVID-19 pandemic. The responses are likely to differ based on the economic standing of each respective nation. So the stimulus and relief package is also likely to differ based on with, whether you're from a developing nation or a developed nation. Um, this, was, this, was a, this was actually written on the, on the sports and recreation um, website. On the 25th of March, 2020, Minister Nati Tetwa committed 150 million towards a relief fund to assist artists, athletes, technical personnel, and its core ecosystem to soften the economic impact of the COVID-19 pandemic. In facilitating the implementation of the relief fund, the department developed a number of, instru of instruments to assist all applicants and further loaded all the tools onto various department platforms, sorry, including social media. Furthermore, the department acceded to the public request to extend the deadline for applications or submissions to 6 April 2020. So as you can understand, that I, as, as I found for South African athletes has been the sole um, uh, potential funding relief that, uh, that athletes could find in South Africa. I've not found any other any other method. So is this a blessing in disguise for professional players? And do they actually need the full? Well, this is an interesting question. You're on your, it's part of a bigger question we're constantly asking us. Are we playing too much sport? In a paper titled, titled How Much is Too Much? Um, by the International Olympic Committee consensus statement on load in sport and, and risk of injury. The IOC defines load as a sport and non-sport burden the sport and non-sport burden, um, single or multiple physiological, psychological, or mechanical stresses as a stimulus that is applied to a human biological system, including subcellular elements, a single cell, tissues, one or more multiple organ systems, or the individual. They further go on to state that load can be applied to the individual human biological system over varying time periods, which can be seconds, minutes, hours, uh, days, weeks, months, years, and, and at varying magnitudes as well, so difference in duration of frequency or intensity of, of load. So the authors further describe load management as a, major risk, as a major risk factor for injury. They report that the, they report that insufficient respect of the balance between loading and recovery can lead to prolonged fatigue and abnormal um, training responses, which are maladaptation. Furthermore, high absolute training and competition load was identified as a risk factor for injury in multiple sports, including rugby union, uh, football and athletics, among other sports. So a lot of effort goes into load monitoring practices in sport, um, and a lot of measures are apply, uh, have been applied generally, uh, from GPS tracking to uh, sleep monitoring and self-reporting of um, exertional states following exercise. Um, this is done with the understanding that poor, poorly, poor load management in training and competition can increase uh, injury risk. 
So using rugby, in 2017, a research paper titled, How Much Rugby is Too Much? A seven season prospective cohort study of match exposure and injury risk in professional rugby union players. But the investigator noticed some key points and I've just chosen to highlight two of these. They mentioned that players who've been involved in low or high number of matches. So low would be less than 15, high would be over 35 over the previous 12 months are more susceptible to injury. This then highlights why, obviously when you look at that, this would highlight why workloads, well, the monitoring of workloads and responses to that are actually quite significant. The second point that they also highlighted was that involvement in, in 35 matches over a 12 month period should be considered as an upper limit for professional rugby union players. So if you take both studies into account and bear in mind that some of the players will quali qualify to play both domestic and international rugby, um, for South Africans, uh, New Zealanders, Australians, um, this encompasses domestic, domestic club competitions, super rugby, and the rigors of travel, uh, which includes susceptibility uh, to, to illness uh, due to the crossing of multiple time zones, um, as well as the international season. So the rate at which um, we play in overseas leagues, you know, fortunately, maybe rugby is quite a good example in that as well, is that the rate at which we play tends to be quite mitigated uh, in general. There's a view that once players return from international duty, they will be given time off their mandatory rest periods that have been built into various leagues uh, to afford players this time. So a consideration about load and the risk on players and consideration from the previous study that also speaks into the number of games potentially that may, potenti uh, that may uh, put players at risk of injury. Uh, I think those things have been considered in, in how rugby has structured itself. So what are prof professional players doing now? Well, Perhaps for me, I'm fortunate just to be involved with, with some of these, with two organizations, Kaiser Chiefs and, and at rugby, uh, with our national rugby side. Um, and there are a lot of, I suppose people now are engaged in quite a lot of trading, various online trading modalities, uh, which are being monitored by the various uh, conditioning coaches. And this is quite difficult to carry out. I think if you saw from uh, Dr. Play's, one of Dr. Play's slides, um, I think it speaks into, you are effectively detraining. So it's just an interesting period at the moment because it's a question of, of, of um, how much can really uh, be gotten done in this time where, where lockdown has been imposed. Um, there are a few privileged uh, athletes who have access to, access to facilities such as farms and large spaces who can effectively do some of their conditioning training in more enabling environments. But I think for a lot of athletes, um, the environment isn't exactly as, as enabling as, as one would like. The major aim of, of course, of, of what the athletes are doing now and the clubs that have put on them is, is to try and shorten the adjustment period uh, so that uh, the return to sporting, to regular sporting activity actually, albeit under probably uncertain and, and, and quite stringent circumstances can be as smooth as possible and as quick as possible. Uh, what hygiene lessons can be carried uh, with the sports persons forever? Well, it's an interesting one again, because uh, I guess it, it goes into what I think colleagues tend to speak to athletes um, the measures that are, are being spoken about, hand washing, and protecting yourself from those that are ill, are things I think that uh, sports colleagues, even as, as, a, as, a, junior, as a junior colleague, I was, I was learning from colleagues, that um, these are the measures that they would actually emphasize to players. It's an interesting thing that now that we've had a pandemic, perhaps these get taken a little bit more seriously. So hopefully, I think in this brave new era, we'll see a change in, in some of those practices. But for the fan experience, I think you know, that's where things become a little bit difficult. It's a big question of, of what it will mean for, for fan engagement with, with the sports heroes or, or engagement with various ministerial um, 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 attendees at, at these various sporting events. Um, I, I guess this is quite an evolving situation and it would be interesting just to see how it goes. I mean, it, it speaks also into just how, how the various federations or the various sports will have to, to manage their, their um, various fan experiences with, 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 within their stadiums or, or their various arenas. So with social distancing, is there a uh, less risk of stringent monitoring of doping? I want to say from our context in South Africa, well, for the period of lockdown, yes. Um, as institutions and bodies like SAIDs are not seen as essential services. Um, but in the case where we have soft, uh, a soft lockdown, then it's, um, it's very likely no. So if, if in this soft, soft lockdown, there's potential for sport to be allowed to participate, then it's very likely that um, the answer to that is no for, under those circumstances. Um, with regards to this, WADA has actually released quite a great Q&A article uh, regarding this matter. 
Um, they point out that testing is likely to continue with measures uh, being taken to protect the athlete and the anti-doping official from any adverse exposure uh, during the sample collection uh, process. Um, it's also placed on the athlete, unfortunately, uh, to make the anti-doping agent, agent and local, sorry, to make the anti-doping agency and local health officials aware of any change in their health status so that precautions can also be taken. Um, when, clubs, when can clubs and schools feel safe in returning to their sporting programs? Uh, I wanted to say, well, the easy answer, the easy answer is when there's a sustainable cure and vaccine. Um, but again, I mean, we're not, we're not in that era at the moment. Um, I think one has to consider that there's, this is quite a new understanding that we're busy gaining. Um, you also recall that Prof Richards earlier answered, um, answered something with regards to this way. He spoke about potential reinfection while also touching on the individuals, uh, sorry, on each individual's potential uh, risk of disability following infection. Um, just, uh, sorry, Dr. Play has also touched on this aspect, I must add. Um, the only thing I would add is that I, I just think um, there are many complex complexities with our current situation. Um, the guidance from government has been good with the focus of staying the course in the strategy of flattening the curve, which is a suppression model that we, we've adopted. Um, so when is the right time to return to sport? Very likely when these various phase disease reduction strategies are relaxed. And this is a fluid situation, unfortunately, which is constantly being monitored and monitored by government in consultation with experts in the health field. So they haven't really given a rough date because that, that may be difficult to ascertain as things are unfolding. So when, when we do return to sports, are there additional precautions that we should take? Well, I definitely think so. I think um, if you look at the sporting events themselves, um, many are scrambling, I think, to put um, risk mitigation uh, measures in place. Um, these risk mitigation uh, measures also have to be done in consultation with the various um, player associations and, and player unions, so that there's agreement that, uh, you know, regarding the risk and, and the, the risk mitigation methods that have been put in place to protect athletes from infection. Um, there's different potential meanings for, for a competition that gets underway and, and perhaps a player now tests positive after that, tests positive for COVID-19 once that happens. Um, I guess still we will, we will see just what, what ends up being applied with regards to that. So for the individual, I just wanted to add that for me, I think, even though I think the prof has touched on that, potentially there may not be any uh, potentially long lasting uh, harmful effects on individuals potential to exercise. I just think that um, as I look at it from my understanding, it puts great emphasis on athlete pre-participation screening and periodic health uh, evaluations. I think there'll be a great value of knowledge just uh, gained from that considering that we are in, in quite uncertain times that it is a novel virus. We are learning as we're going along. Um, I think we will only be learning uh, the potential long-term impacts on, on athletic participation and, and, and how, how we actually continue playing sport uh, once, once we've actually settled uh, from where we are in this pandemic. What are the individual teams and federations putting in place for their, for their players or teams to be uh, at their peak once the lockdown is lifted? Well, I think we touched on that. Uh, the various programs are there, but I think in fairness, if you consider Dr. Dr. Play's slide just we spoke about that in, in effect we are detraining. Um, it'll be an interesting thing how, how one adapts to return athletes to play. I mean, should you remove a preseason period? What does it mean once you remove a preseason period? What are the targets that actually were meant to be met in a preseason period? Well, those things are basically going to fall away. Uh, the advantage of a period like this that we have, though, is that those that are injured at least have time to address some of the injuries. Um, some who have been carrying chronic overuse injuries have time to actually rest through these things. And perhaps that detraining isn't necessarily such a bad thing for them. Um, if the season, right, I think, yeah, I think if I look at my, my notes here, I think I should have covered most of the aspects that, um, yep. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Mampane, for that. Uh, discussion around some of those important questions. I think you answered a lot of people's questions. Uh, we have about uh, 25 minutes left and I'd like to spend that time dealing with people's questions. And as I mentioned, the main one focuses around return to sport for various uh, levels of sport, be it at an individual level, be it at a school level or a club level or provincial or international level. 
I'm going to be a little bit contentious and just start off by making a statement, and that is that it will not be safe to return to sport in the light of this pandemic until we have a vaccine available. Would you like to comment on that? Yeah, well, I think that <clears throat> we're only ever going to <clears throat> get on top of the uh, infection once we have sufficient herd immunity. Now, herd immunity, as I said, can be obtained by a large percentage of the population actually having had the infection. Otherwise, we need to get an, an actual vaccine. So when you say not safe to return to sport, you are really implying, uh, would it be possible for you to contract the illness when you are involved in your sport or you were a spectator um, in the sport? So that's not really talking about the, the um, safety in terms of health effects of the disease itself if you have had the disease. But I would agree with you that herd immunity will be necessary before you can actually open up sports fully. The irony being, of course, that we're doing our best to prevent that herd immunity developing naturally at the moment. Uh, so it's a little bit counterintuitive, although we certainly we, understand we, that. We are, but remember that if we had the sort of surge that we've seen in New York or Italy or Spain, where the health system wouldn't be able to handle it. Okay. The ICUs wouldn't be able to handle it, and we would then have significant mortality. Absolutely. Um, Dr. Pillay, perhaps talk us through some of the issues that your task team thinks about on a weekly basis in terms of football returning to the competitive stage and the factors you take into consideration for players, administrators, and spectators. Thanks for that, John. Uh, number one, we're always wondering when is lockdown going to end? Because <laughs> that, is, that is the most vital aspect of things. Uh, and, and as we also, Prof Karim's uh, talk the other evening, uh, they've come up with some data of numbers of saying when lockdown can slowly start easing. Uh, and that would probably mean that the curve, as they say, is being flattened and we started to get a more controlled exposure. And that would probably be the time that we can start returning uh, things to a little bit more normality when it comes to the sporting environment, but still controlling things. Meaning that my, 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 my gut feel is that when we do start returning to sports, it's gonna be under lots of guidelines and protocols that need to be followed, uh, number one. Number two, it's going to be behind closed doors because what you don't want to do is you don't want to expose a massive amount of people to a virus, uh, which in fact is what we're trying to do right now with the lockdown. And I think that would probably be the way for everything to move forward. Uh, other things that we sit and think about is, um, and things that I have brought to the attention of administrators, because administrators never think about these things, is uh, with regards to when the lockdown starts getting eased and people can start socializing again and getting back into their systems of sports, trying to explain to them that even if a lockdown has to end tomorrow, it will take another four weeks for an athlete to safely become competitive again. So they have to take those things in perspective of when they plan in how matches would happen, if they even whether there's going to be a second or a third lockdown or anything of that sort, and have those kind of things. So all these documents are being changed on a regular basis, depending on what information is becoming available, et cetera. Uh, up to last week, most things were sorted out. When the new lockdown was mentioned, uh, things had to be jumbled up and changed again, uh, especially from the, from the league perspective of a potential start at things. So there's lots of, lots of sharing of ideas and information going around between and because the health and the occupational health as well as the legal aspects, as well as the government's uh, Disaster Management Act, as well as um, lots of other perspectives, all interlink. There's, there's often, and that's where I've learned how to use Zoom with the many meetings we've been having uh, with the task team members. And uh, so it's, it's not an easy task at all trying to get all this information together and trying to have a plan of action in order to make sure that uh, sports things are going to be safer than they are at this point in time of course 
we can't mitigate 100% any kind of circumstances. And I don't think we'll be able to do that because this virus is here to stay with us. But what can we do in order to make sure that we advise people, we have protocols in place and clubs are adhering to certain things um, to reduce these kind of incidents. So it sounds like you're advocating a phased approach. We're in the isolation period, self-training period at the moment, waiting for lockdown to end. That may then lead to a, uh, a, a controlled training environment, which uh, is non-competitive. We'll follow that with competition without spectators, but televised. And then the Correct. final stage would be get back to sport as we know it. Uh, but a caveat to that would be to implement as many of the stringent um, lifestyle changes that we've become a, a accustomed to uh, from now on going forward. Would that be a fair enough summary? Yeah, I think that is the fair enough summary. And that's basically, I mean, I've been speaking to a lot of the athletes at the moment. And uh, some of them have said they've never washed their hands so much in this last three weeks than they've ever in their life before. So it's definitely become a, a new neurocognitive thing that we've all developed in these last three to four weeks of ensuring the social distancing, the washing of the hands, etc., all the basics first. Correct. Let's take that into a university or a school environment now. Mm. Would you say if it's safe for them to be in the lecture halls or in the classroom together, it's safe for them to be on the sports field? Would that be a fair enough uh, statement to make? Or do we limit social contact as much as possible? Who are you asking that to? Just generally, anyone's welcome to comment. I mean, if we do we make a decision, we go open the universities and schools and it's open for sport and for learning, or do we do it in a phase? Is there an argument that it should be phased? From well, if you're talking, if you've opened the schools, <clears throat> then the contact that you're going to have in the classroom is going to be very much the same as the contact or potential for transmission on the sports field. So then you have to say, well, all right, we've decided that that's an aspect of uh, social isolation which is going to be removed, and therefore one, one should allow sport to take place as well. Okay. I ask that because there is an argument that's been put forward on the questions that you can do one or the other, but, but not both. But I, I, I certainly agree with you. Can we move back to some of the medical questions, Professor Richards, in terms of the use of aspirin? Um, in, in patients with COVID-19, um, recommended or not? Well, <clears throat> uh, one of the major problems in uh, COVID-19, the, the, the severe disease, is a hypercoagulable state. Um, and certainly that is one of the factors that predicts mortality. Whether or not aspirin would reduce that potential, one doesn't know. Certainly, we don't want anybody less than the age of 18 taking aspirin because uh, the risk with viral infection and aspirin causing the so-called Reyes syndrome, which is liver failure and encephalopathy, is dramatically increased. So, so avoid aspirin, certainly if you're a child. And uh, who knows, possibly there may be some uh, benefit if you're on aspirin, if you should contract the more severe forms of the disease. And then we've spoken a little bit about non-steroidal anti-inflammatories. There are cohorts of patients who need to be on these, rheumatoid arthritis, osteoarthritis, etc. Do we continue those? Is it a, a risk-benefit uh, way up that the clinician has to do, or should those be stopped and alternative therapies implemented? Well, certainly people who are, uh, have those types of diseases you would hope that their degree of control using biologics, et cetera, may be such that they don't need the non -steroidal. But uh, do remember that the biologics um, are also potentially immunosuppressive. Now, I just want to comment slightly about that because there is possibly some benefit in terms of being relatively immunosuppressed. In other words, as yet, there isn't good evidence that patients who are HIV positive and immunocompromised have an increased potential for more severe disease. And maybe that is related to the fact that they are unable to mount that cytokine storm or that hyperinflammatory response that occurs in the more severely involved patients. So we don't really know all those answers. Also, with all the millions of people that have been uh, ill already, 
there hasn't been a dramatic increase reported in patients who are on chemotherapeutic agents or on other biologics for other autoimmune disease. So it is just vaguely possible, and I'm not saying this is as a fact, that patients who have a degree of immunosuppression for one reason or another may actually be a little better off. They might still contract the disease, but then hopefully would not progress to that hyperinflammatory response related to the cytokine storm. From a theoretical perspective, that certainly does, does make sense. Some further questions coming in about transmission of the virus in a sporting environment on soccer balls, netballs, and also in the swimming pool. Any comment on that, or do we just not know? Well, swimming pools are going to be uh, safe because all swimming pools are sterilized using a chlorine uh, and uh, a, a chlorine-based disinfectant is very effective in killing this virus. So that certainly isn't going to be a big issue. It can sit on, um, the, the virus can be on various uh, surfaces. Um, and uh, uh, theoretically then transmission would be possible if one is going to head a ball that somebody else has headed that you may then have it on your head and you may then transmit it into, or spread it to your mouth or your eyes. But I would say that that relative to the risk in terms of somebody coughing or sneezing or breathing on you right close up is very small. Then there's a question on uh, hypertensive patients who have poor outcomes, uh, poor outcomes in patients on ACE inhibitors. Um, can you comment on that? And should clinicians be looking at changing their treatments? So there was a suggestion that the ACE inhibitors and the angiotensin receptor blockers may actually increase the ACE2 receptor in the lungs. And that is the receptor to which the virus actually binds. Um, there hasn't been any follow-up in terms of that being the reason why hypertensive patients have a greater potential for developing more severe disease or cardiac disease. I think it probably is more likely to be related to poorly controlled hypertension and pre-existent myocardial dysfunction or hypertrophy uh, that might be causing the, uh, the actual problem. I, I think it's unlikely. And certainly, if you're taking an ACE inhibitor or an ARB because of LV failure, you must continue taking it because the, the mortality effect of stopping it would be far greater than the potential risk of there being a problem uh, in, with, in relation to COVID-19. Following on from that, in cardiac patients who may contract uh, the infection, particularly those with elevated troponin levels, is there a risk of more permanent damage in these patients from a cardiac perspective? Well, certainly they have an increase in mortality, and not only that, there is also a potential for myocardial infarction related to the uh, thrombotic potential of this virus that occurs uh, uh, in the vascular system. So yes, there is a potential for there to be myocardial injury. But again, I must stress that people are, must be aware that this is only in that very small percentage that get into that hyperinflammatory phase, not the vast majority of people who have mild or asymptomatic infections. That's not going to cause a permanent myocardial injury. What places the diabetic at increased risk? What's the pathophysiology behind that? Well, uh, diabetics are relatively immunosuppressed. The primary abnormality usually is an abnormality of neutrophil function. Uh, but the neutrophil interacts with the lymphocytes and is directed by the lymphocytes. And it probably is related to some uh, inability to uh, counteract the, uh, the inflammatory effect. I'm not sure of the exact mechanism, only that that is the, one of the few definite, definite immune suppressed groups that is more at risk. I'm not sure of the mechanism. And then the last specifically medical question, uh, autoimmune diseases, uh, are they placing uh, those individuals at greater risk of uh, infection and, and more severe disease? 
Well, remember, as I was mentioning, many of those patients on autoimmune diseases are already on immunosuppressive drugs. And we have not seen as yet a, 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 a higher proportion of patients on immunosuppressive drugs or otherwise immunosuppressed other than diabetes uh, as uh, uh, contracting the more severe manifestations. They probably would be at the same risk of contracting the virus as the others, but perhaps, and I'm only saying perhaps, they may actually be relatively protected from the more severe manifestations of the disease. And then just to the, the sports physician, some good comments coming through here about this phased approach and looking at playing behind closed doors and no spectators. Of course, the players still have to get there. So the issues related to travel uh, in groups and also to hotels, etc. Are those being taken into consideration in your deliberations? Um, yes, most definitely. So besides the match days, given some guidance with regards to traveling, hotels, etc. Uh, I think it's important for us to realize, and people are also asking questions about if flights are locked down, how are players going to get to places? That firstly, what we need to do is wait for the government to announce these ease on the lockdown uh, situations and wherever they're going to start relax, relaxing certain aspects. It is only after that, then a decision can be made about return to all of these sporting activities, etc. So it's no point of returning to sport if, if uh, flights are locked down at all. Because again, like people have mentioned, how are they going to get to all their competitive areas? So I think it's important that we realize that um, we have to first wait for that decision to be made first, before a further decision at a later stage. Thanks very much, uh, Ali. Um, I think we're going to look at closing up the session here. Um, are there any other comments that any of the uh, panelists would like to make? There's quite a big storm brewing around us and it's starting to affect the quality of the webinar. So I think if we can take some last comments, I'm then going to put that slide up with the MCQ questions for people to look at, but perhaps some uh, final comments from each of the panelists. Professor Richards, could we start with you? Yeah, I just want to uh, reassure people in terms of their concern with regard to the potential for long-lasting effects. Those long-lasting effects are only likely to be a problem in patients who've had the more severe disease in hospital with the pneumonia and most importantly, those patients who end up being ventilated. And when we look at that as a percentage of disease, that really is only about five to 6% of the total and people, particularly if you're younger and fit, are very unlikely to actually get into that type of situation. So I just want to reassure people that way. Thanks very much. Um, Dr. Mampane, any final questions or comments? Yeah, I think, I think just some thoughts on, on what you spoke about. I, I thought it's just an interesting comment. I think the idea that um, we should return only when there's a vaccine. Um, just some interesting comments. I mean, I'd seen that uh, the w someone even raised that the, the WWE is actually happening behind closed doors, even though they and they've been uh, granted a non-essential service status in, in that country. I've seen that even with regards to the, the EFC, they were looking at hosting the events perhaps in isolation. And I was told that, that, that um, some potential rugby unions were also considering maybe just taking the athletes away from one segment or one, one to one specific location and seeing if they can just homogenize the environmental effect. It's an interesting one because again, at the end of the, at the, end of the day, how do you mitigate the risks? It's a tough one. Correct. Uh, sorry, you, you're breaking up there, uh, Dr. Mapan. Dr. Pillay, if you can still hear us, some final comments, please. Yeah, I just like to say to people, and I see a lot of people I'm talking about school sports, etc., and returning to that aspect. Uh, Prof has also uh, mentioned something about returning back to school. It, logic should reason that we should uh, be able to return back to sports. What's important that people need to realize is whatever activity we're going to be returning back to, we need to ensure, and people need to ensure if they're working in those environments, that there are processes and protocols in place with regards to uh, hand hygiene, respiratory hygiene, 
cleaning equipment, et cetera, all of those kind of guidelines have to be in place uh, in order to make sure that there's some methods of risk mitigation being done besides um, just uh, ensuring that the athlete or the, the, the child is doing things at home. It's much different from trying to teach a child how to sneeze in his elbow than teaching an adult. And that's where a lot of the challenges come in, especially once they're back at school, social distancing becomes a problem. Uh, and I think all of those aspects, it, it needs to sort of be drilled into people about washing the hands all the time, etc. And I think with time, with these last three weeks, I've seen a lot of small little children, five-year-old kids using stuff in shopping centers. I mean, like little uh, shopping malls when they're going to buy food with their parents. And uh, as soon as they touch something, then they go to their mums and ask them to give them the stuff to clean their hands. So I think we are moving in a positive direction, but it's important that when it comes to all these activities that people have these aspects in place already and are prepared for it and don't try and do it as a last minute thought. Thank you very much. And, and thank you to the three panelists, uh, Professor Richards, Drs. Mampana and Pillay for your uh, specialist uh, input. Uh, again, thank you to all those who participated, 500 of you, we appreciate the questions. Uh, I think we'll try and continue to answer some of the questions as we close up here. I am going to put that final MCQ slide up. Please use the same email address on there if you want to send us some comments, if you have questions, and if you'd like to propose further topics for webinars in the future. So thank you very much. Uh, have a good, uh, good evening and uh, please stay safe. Uh, we look forward to resuming sport. Thank you. <laughs>